Stephen Mitchell. I'd like to welcome you to another of my uh, Notes on a Call Sheet podcast. Um, very often I'm asked by people in seminars or just in general on the street, because they approach me on the street sometimes when you least expect it <laughs> with these questions. Aren't you the guy that does that? How do you know? I don't know. I think I saw your picture somewhere. Um, they'll ask me what I think <clears throat> is the most important aspect of, of acting. What's the most important part of acting? Simply put, <clears throat> and I'm tempted to say, well, the part where you negotiate your fee. But then you could say, well, it's the part where the check actually arrives or the check actually clears, and all of those are vital to, uh, to uh, the joy of acting. But uh, in terms of what happens in front of an audience, I think the most important part of acting is that moment, <clears throat> however brief or prolonged, when the audience is wondering what you're going to say or do next, because they're not sure. Why aren't they sure? Well, hopefully, <clears throat> because you have raised doubts in their minds as to who you are. You've removed somehow the total clarity that you're a good guy or a bad guy and that your response is going to be utterly predictable. And uh, that's why, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having an argument with my voice. That's why I'll tell people that if you're playing a bad guy, make him good. And if you're playing a good guy, make him not so good. Maybe he's struggling to be good. Maybe there's something urging him to do something other than good things that he's able to overcome, and he's not good just because he's a good guy. Um, these things make a character or, or a human being, you know, the people you've met in life, rather interesting. And the one thing you can't afford to be as an actor is uninteresting. The quickest way to become uninteresting, I think, is to become totally predictable. And by orchestrating a performance to be somewhat ambiguous and present some challenges to the audience in, in terms of their trying to figure out who you are really and who can we rely on you to be and who are you going to be given the next person you meet. Um, this is an interesting challenge that goes far beyond <clears throat> the challenge of learning lines and saying them with conviction. But it takes you into a world of conceptualizing your character and, and creating relationships that are complex and not by any means clear with the people around you. It's, it's you know, I keep coming back in, in this series of podcasts to the performance that uh, <clears throat> Sir Anthony Hopkins gave in uh, Silence of the Lambs because it was so brilliant in so many ways. Um, in the same movie, he's playing the most despicable person in the world, a hateful, perverted uh, individual. And within the same character, he's playing the guardian angel, if you will, of the FBI agent played by Jodie Foster. That's an interesting mix of, of characteristics and quite a challenge to pull it off. He, and he, neither one was at the expense of the other. He convinced us that he was despicable and disgusting and and a lamentable human being. But at the same time, he did things for Clarice or Jody that only 
a saint might do to guide them through very murky dark waters and lead her into um, well into surviving the experience something that was not a given if if he hadn't taken those actions on her behalf mentoring her so it's um, it's it's an interesting conundrum how do you take a character that may not have been written that way and bring in this uh, ambiguity thereby making an enigma of the character making this character somebody we have to pay attention to and study and hope to anticipate what they're going to do next because it may have it may be that the script was written in a very uh, on the nose fashion and everything is clear and you know you I watched a movie the other night unfortunately and in the first scene I knew the whole movie just from the way the the, the character was introduced and what he said and what he did and uh, so I found myself looking out the window at the abbey across the way, uh, seeing it in its different, as the sun fell, uh, the different lightscapes that, that descended upon the, the, the scenery, as much as I was looking at the movie, because the movie didn't hold me. Uh, but I used to say, and I guess it's still true, that you can learn as much from watching a bad movie or a bad performance as you can from watching a good one, because you start to look at what's going wrong, what isn't right about this, why am I disinterested, what are they not doing that they should be doing, and those answers inform what you do next, whether as a filmmaker or as an actor or as a writer. Um, I, I once had a script I'd written called uh, Torment, the, the story of the cover girl killer, and uh, it was a detective movie set in Los Angeles and uh, these cover girls were dying one after the other it made great copy and it was sort of a uh, uh, an interesting I thought interesting uh, who done it or how do you do it or who's, who's who, there was some psychological impact here where you didn't see who the killer was and the guy you thought was killer the, the killer was actually orchestrating it but not doing it. Enough of that. I had, um, at the time, uh, we, we had maybe a hundred people in the uh, repertory company, and I had each of my clients read a particular scene in, in the script. It's where our hero, the, the police lieutenant, comes and, and he's in, goes to a prison to ask a convicted murderer some things wanting to get some information and uh, as I like to say as I wrote the role I pictured a guy with eight thousand dollars worth of tattoos on his face neck and torso and uh, I thought that would be kind of interesting we see that more often now than we did back then and um, uh, that's how I saw it but I wanted everybody in the in the company to read that part of the of the convict in prison from their own particular signature or brand, if you will. So I had older ladies reading the part as they would. They played it as a grandmother. It's just the dialogue wasn't dialogue you'd expect from a grandmother. And bookish guys would come in and read it like they were, you know, an actuarial at an insurance company. And uh, the femme fatales would come in and vamp the dialogue. and so. We had every every possible um, brand reading this scene, and suddenly I I began to see as as they'd come in and take their turns reading this, that each one of them was more interesting in performing the the part than the way I envisioned it in my mind with this heavy duty menacing convict. The idea of someone's grandmother ratting out somebody on another murder and then at the end of the scene the, the dialogue was, do I look like a murderer to you? 
and the cop doesn't know what to say and the, she just laughs and says I ask that of everybody and the answer always amuses me now if you can imagine that as a scene it, it can be quite haunting to to have a character say that especially when you know they're in prison for having committed that murder it it makes the scene somewhat more ambiguous and and more thought-provoking more than anything it pointed out to me how obvious my writing was on that scene in which I thought I was doing something fascinating and I had no clue as to how obvious I was being and um, that changed a lot for me in the way I, I, I cast parts in the from that point forward and I think uh, as you get a, a scene or a, a movie let's hope that uh, maybe written in an obvious way as I had written that scene or imagined that scene bringing something unusual to it which you can't necessarily change the uh, the, the dialogue uh, that's generally not an actor's place and you unless you have an unusual relationship with a director and writer or sometimes it's the same guy same girl but um, you want to bring something that causes that dialogue which is written in primary colors and is very obvious and on the nose that sets it on a Dutch angle uh, Dutch angle by the way if you, if you it's an old Hollywood term from the movies uh, when you tilt the camera slightly and and we're looking at the scene uh, slightly um, out of skew that's called a Dutch angle. It can be right or left, but uh, it can be very effective. And we see this in a lot of film noir movies, and uh, probably uh, quite frequently in uh, Carol Reed's *The Third Man*, Orson Welles' uh, *Citizen Kane*. But the, the idea is, it, in a way, you're throwing a Dutch angle on your performance. The dialogue may be written for Doris Day or Rock Hudson or just the most straight individual you could possibly imagine or one of those uh, cheap film noirs from the 50s late 40s where he's just a bad guy through and through and yet you put a little something on it a nice smile or, or uh, an affectionate look as you're saying terrible things or you're giving a frown to somebody when you're saying how much you care for them uh, this throws everything into uh, a conceptual Dutch angle if you will and makes everybody wonder what should I believe now what he's saying or, or what he's showing combination of the two uh, it, 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 it creates a thought process and that thought process, if you will, is, I think, contributes to what audiences perceive as star quality. The idea to fast, the, the, the ability to fascinate, to make us think, to make us wonder. Because if we're not wondering what you're going to new, do next, it means, one, we already know, because you're so damned obvious about it. Or two, we don't care because you've bored us to tears and we just want to leave uh, and get out of there but it would be rude to walk out when someone else is still watching the movie uh, how about that for a couple of interpretations but you see what I mean if you you need as as our entertainer you need to have everybody in the audience caring about you wondering about you fascinating about you you need to involve their thought process there's nobody in the theater watching the movie or watching the play who you can afford to have unhappy and bored and wondering when it's all going to end and we don't get them fascinating over us by just speaking the dialogue and even in films or plays where the dialogue is extraordinary you 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 look at Shakespeare 
and how he came up with his writings is anyone's guess. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which sand, will, uh, which grain will grow and which will not, uh, you look at Patty Chayefsky's *The Hospital* or *Network*. Brilliant dialogue, none better. Or Rod Serling, uh, the dialogue he wrote for Seven Days in May*. Brilliant. But even in even in plays or movies that are known for their dialogue to be dialogue driven. It still requires the complexity of a human character who's tormented at, a, at some kind of turning point and is um, coping with something, whatever it might be, to make that dialogue live and breathe. And there's, I, I don't think there's any play or movie that an actor can just rely on the dialogue and and it's going to be taken care of. There's a funny story in uh, in the movie Day for Night, Le Nuit Américain by uh, Truffaut where one of the actresses, it's a, it's a movie about making movies and uh, one of the actresses at dinner one night is telling stories to the rest of the cast saying there was this guy who did Shakespeare and he came out and everybody booed and at the end of the performance while they're booing him he said I didn't write this shit not understanding it was his acting that they were booing and not the writing so the the, the dialogue as good as it is still needs you to be utterly fascinating and unpredictable and come up with things that as, as I'll say put put a Dutch angle on on the scene on the performance on the character and make them rethink what it's all about. Um, this can be done to excess, but I think generally you have a long way to go before you get there. Uh, obviously you don't want to go into a movie that's, uh, um, I don't know, <laughs> I was going to say a chick flick, a, a straight ahead commercial movie and start making it look like a David Lynch film. <laughs> That might be going to excess, but within within the parameters of, of the of the genre, the context, and and uh, what it is you're doing, there there are plenty of ways to put put a bit of body English on the performance and uh, have people wonder about it and and ask themselves because if they're not asking themselves, you haven't involved them, and this generally comes about, this moment of, of um, inspection by the audience typically happens uh, during the interstitial reactions or during a responsive reaction. And because once someone said something and once someone else has said something to you or whether you've said it and you're having a reaction, that reaction draws us in and makes us wonder make use of it. Don't give us reactions that are, you know, selling the same real estate that the dialogue just sold. Show us something different. Make us doubt what you just said, rather than just drive home what you just said. Anyway, uh, for me that's the most important part of acting. We'll call it the Dutch angle. And uh, Try it. Use it in a monologue. Tape yourself. See if it doesn't work. See if you can't find something that works for your brand and makes you more fascinating than just speaking the dialogue did. Uh, send me an email. Let me know how it goes. I'm at cineparis at hotmail.com. My uh, blog is emcpb.blogspot.com. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, hopefully... We'll uh, sit in again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.